It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Well, Speaker, this question is for the Premier. Recently, through freedom of information requests, the NDP has obtained nearly 4,000 pages of records from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing that discuss the Premier's infamous green belt grab. The documents include emails that were forwarded to Ryan Amato, the former Chief of Staff, to the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. One thing that kept coming up in these documents, Speaker, are several uses of the phrase G asterisk or G star. So my question to the Premier is, does the Premier have any idea what that means or why it would be used in internal communications with Mr. Amato and the Minister's office? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, look, uh, uh, I think I've addressed that on multiple occasions uh, as, as the, uh, the Integrity Commissioner, uh, Speaker. But what we're continuing to focus on is ensuring that we put in place uh, the conditions that will help more homes be built across the province of Ontario. Look, we inherited a situation in the province of Ontario where the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, frankly, had put obstacle after obstacle in the way of getting homes built. Those obstacles had led us to a housing crisis, which we have been relentless in trying to get resolved. Now, Mr. Speaker, during the time of the, of the Liberals, you saw housing starts either decrease or, or be level, uh, leveled uh, below what was required. Since we have come to office, since we've started removing those obstacles, you're seeing year after year, not only the highest level of purpose-built rental housing uh, ever in Ontario's history, but you're also seeing that housing starts have averaged up each and every year. So we're going to continue to remove the obstacles that were put in the, in the way uh, by the previous Liberal government, and we're going to continue to build more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. No, no, I, I, I don't think it has been addressed, actually. And, well, Speaker, while this, this G star, G asterisk, or whatever could be a sh cute shorthand, it carries a lot of significance here. Because when we compared the original emails with those forwarded to Mr. Amato, it was very obvious that G star meant Greenbelt. It means that a search, though, of Mr. Amato's account using the term Greenbelt wasn't going to return those particular emails. It means that replacing the word Greenbelt with G-Star is evidence of an intent to conceal like someone was trying to cover their tracks. So my question back to the Premier, was anyone directed to avoid or conceal references to the Greenbelt in their written communications so they could avoid being captured in a Freedom of Information request? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Speaker. Look, as I just said, uh, we, uh, the Integrity Commissioner has uh, uh, has issued a report on that. I think I've answered the question on numerous uh, occasions. But at the same time, Speaker, it, it doesn't change the fact that we are faced with a situation in the province of Ontario, and frankly across the uh, country in very many respects, uh, where we need to get more homes built. Uh, we need to put in place the conditions that will see more homes built, especially in the province of Ontario. Look, we inherited an absolute mess. Not just a mess that led to a housing crisis, a budgetary mess. We, mess. we inherited a mess that saw manufacturing leave the province of Ontario on record levels. It is no secret that when this government took office, we wanted to remove those barriers. And those barriers that we have been lifting have seen record job creation across the province of Ontario. So more people setting up businesses in the province of Ontario, billions of dollars worth of economic investment hundreds of thousands of people coming to this province for the hope and opportunity Response. that this government has, uh, has allowed uh, to flourish across the province means more homes need to be built. We'll remove the obstacles that the Liberals put in the way, and we'll get the job done. The final supplementary. So, Speaker, in addition to G-Star, the government adopted the term special project to refer to the Greenbelt grab. The term is used at least 80 times just in the FOI records that we've, we've acquired. Mr. Amato and Patrick Sackville, who I will remind folks watching is the Premier's current Chief of Staff, exchanged multiple emails referring to this, quote, special project, including between their personal accounts. According to the Integrity Commissioner's report, Mr. Amato identified Mr. Sackville as the, quote, decision maker in the Premier's office for this project. So I'm going back to the Premier again, hoping for an answer. 
Did anyone in the Premier's office direct others to avoid email or use code words when discussing the special project of carving up the Greenbelt? And when is the Premier going to be disclosing this to the RCMP? Members, please take your seat. Minister of Affairs and Housing. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, again, Speaker, look, uh, as I said, the Integrity Commissioner has, uh, has issued a report, and I think I've answered the question on, uh, on numerous occasions. Uh, but getting back to the, 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 the facts as they stand, in the province of Ontario, we inherited a situation in 2018 that saw Ontario not only in a housing crisis but in an economic crisis. We were faced with a situation where we needed to balance the budget, we needed to reduce taxes, we needed to re re uh, eliminate red tape that was stifling growth across the province of Ontario. Now, housing affordability isn't just about removing obstacles, Mr. Speaker. I can remove all the obstacles. I can remove all the obstacles that I want, Mr. Speaker. But housing affordability also has to do with people's ability to order housing. And the high interest rate, high inflation policies of the federal government are removing too many people from the ability to buy their first home, from the ability to rent that home. And Mr. Speaker, Spons. on April 1st, you will see again even more costs at the feet of the people of the province of Ontario with another increase in the carbon tax. You want housing affordability? We'll remove obstacles. Help us Here keep you. taxes down so more people can afford Here those you. homes. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. You think you can hide, but you cannot hide from this. You cannot hide from this. It's going to come out. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. The reason this is important is because it is part of a growing mountain of evidence that the government has deliberately tried to cover up the details of its $8 billion greenbelt grab. Last year, the Auditor General uncovered evidence that government officials had inappropriately used personal email accounts and devices when discussing the greenbelt grab. Today's FOI shows more of the same between Mr. Amato and Mr. Sackville in the Premier's office. So back to the Premier again, is it standard operating procedure to have staff use personal devices and accounts when discussing the special project known internally as G-Star? Remind the members to make their comments to the chair. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I said, and I, uh, you know, uh, the Integrity Commissioner has issued a report, the Auditor General has issued a report. This government has acted on a, a public policy a decision that was not supported by the people of the of Ontario. But what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, and what we have been doing since day one is focusing on rebuilding the province of Ontario that was left a mess by the previous Liberal government supported by the NDP. We had the highest over regulated economy in Canada. And now, Mr. Speaker, we have removed those obstacles. We have removed that unnecessary red tape and regulation. And the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade has attracted over $28 billion worth of investment to the province of Ontario. Where before, manufacturers were leaving Ontario. Now they are coming back and fighting to be part of this economy, Mr. Speaker. That is what we are accomplishing. Where before our students Spons. were failing in school, now they are not only leading Canada, they are leading the world. We're putting more money back in the Order. pockets of the people of the province of Ontario. But unfortunately, the high inflation, high spending, high debt policies of the federal Liberal government have led to a crisis that is seeing interest rates putting too many people out of the ability to buy their first home. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The supplementary question. Speaker, the stench of this scandal has seeped into everything this government touches. That's right. That's the truth. Yeah. Speaker, the Information and Privacy Commissioner has already warned the government. I'll remind them about deleting emails and concealing information through the use of personal emails and personal devices after we uncovered that government officials were already doing that. Deleting emails related to this massive government policy, using personal accounts or not, is contravention of the law. So when the Liberals did that, someone went to jail. Someone went to jail. So back to the Premier. Why did your staff delete emails related to the Greenbelt Graph? Minister of Affairs and Housing. 
I remind the Leader of the Opposition that uh, when the Liberals broke the law, it was the NDP that kept them in power, which has led to the economic catastrophe that was the province of Ontario in 2018, Mr. Speaker. Now, we have moved on so many fronts to restore Ontario as the engine of, Canadian, of the Canadian economy. Look, we're doing things that puts more money back in the Order. of the people of Ontario. Look at what the Minister, Associate Minister of Transportation has been able to accomplish with respect to one fare. Now, they talked about it a lot. But it was never, they were never able to get it done. This government got it done. That's about $1,600 in the pockets of the people uh, of Ontario. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, we were able to build subways. You know why? Because we're focused on getting results for the people of the province of Ontario. Now, they announced it a million times. They kept announcing and announcing and announcing, getting nothing done. We're building hospitals in long-term care homes in parts of the province that have never had them before, Mr. Speaker. We are restoring Ontario as the best place to live, work, invest, and raise a family, not only in Canada, but the entire world. Final supplementary. Speaker, Liberals went to jail because we found them out. That's right. That's you right. know? And people, people in Ontario shouldn't have to use a code breaker Order. to know what their government is up to. Right? So we know it wasn't just emails, right? The Premier has admitted to using his personal phone for government business. He says it all the time, every day, and yet he refuses, refuses to share his phone records. Why? What is he hiding? Brown envelopes, coded messages, burner phone speaker. At every turn, it looks like the Premier's office took deliberate steps to cover their tracks. We're going to get to the bottom of it, Speaker. We sure will, or the RCMP will, because this government is under criminal investigation. But they could come clean right now, and they might help themselves. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier again, when will he finally own up to his role in this scheme, or do we have to wait for the RCMP? Members, please take their seat. Minister, Mr. Harris and House. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Look, I think the Leader of the Opposition has to stop watching Netflix, uh, uh, because you know what the people of the province of Ontario are focused on? A member for Hamilton Mountain will better come to order. results for their children when they go to school. This Minister of Education has not only delivered peace in our schools, but he's delivering a better quality of education than seeing our students. Imagine this, our students not only leading Canada, but leading North America. They're no longer discovering math, they're learning math because of this Minister of Education. Well, at the same time, this Minister of Long-Term Care is the most successful Minister of Long-Term Care, bringing long-term care to parts of this province that have never had it before. You know why, Mr. Speaker? You know why? Because when the Liberals, supported by the NDP, were in power, they built only six. Opposition come to order. There are Response. more long-term care beds being built in my own riding than there were across the entire province under the Liberals. We're building roads, the 413 in Brampton. You know why? Because it means more jobs and opportunity for the people of Brampton. And we'll get the job done. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Transportation. When the 407 was built, there was a plan for it to be paid by 2027, and then we would own it. Instead, the Conservatives sold it for a song. The tolls have gone up about 300 per cent, and the 407 ETR owns us. The 99-year lease was highway robbery, actually. People <laughs> resent that the 407 tolls are out of control. People want to get where they want to go, and this government could save people time, make the 401 safer, and improve the flow of goods. We proposed a solution to help, and this government voted against it. So my question is, why isn't the government willing to talk about the 407 and toll relief? To respond, the Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, once again, we know what this is all about. It's about their campaign to stop Highway 413, and we will not listen to them, Mr. Speaker. 
The people of the province elected us to build Highway 413. In fact, they lost three members over being on the wrong side of that, Mr. Oh, Speaker. Yeah. Everything that this government has done under the leadership of Premier Ford has been put more money back into the hardworking families of this province, whether it's 10 cents a litre on gas tax, Mr. Speaker, whether it's removing tolls on 412, 418, which that member voted Order. against when this Premier put that forward, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's removing $125 Val tag fees from each car or truck that an individual owns in this province, Mr. Speaker. And on top of that, we are fighting against the 23% increase of the carbon tax that's coming on April 1st. I hope that member also raises her voice to the federal members of, that she knows and her counterparts Spons. to make sure we keep more money in the pockets of hardworking families in Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The 407 is an existing highway we are barely using. And I introduced my private member's bill to remove tolls from the 412 and the 418, and the government took four years to make it happen. I'm suggesting we remove 407 truck tolls, renegotiate the contract to better serve commuters, but would like to be able to do it faster, please. No one wants to wait another four years. Mm -hmm. So let's take the tolls off the trucks, get the trucks off the 401, and make traffic better for everyone. Let's renegotiate the 407 ETR contract. Everyone knows traffic congestion is already brutal, but we could do this now. So my question is, when will this Conservative government be willing to do something about the 407? Members will please take their seats. Mr. Transportation. Mr. Speaker, every single step this government has taken has been around building infrastructure in this province, whether that's our commitment to build Highway 413 or invest $27 billion in roads and highways across this province. But do you know what, Mr. Speaker, whether it's the Liberals or NDP, they don't believe in building roads or highways, Mr. Speaker. In fact, they're doubling down on comments from the federal environment minister who said there's no need to invest in any more roads or highways in Canada, Mr. Speaker. My message to the, both the Liberals and NDP is get out Order. of the bubble. Come to cities like Brampton. Come to cities like Mississauga. Travel the streets and roads of all across this province, whether it's in northern Ontario, southern Ontario, and listen to the drivers. We need to build more infrastructure. We need to build the Bradford Bypass. Order. We need to build the Highway 413. And as we do that, we're going to continue to fight against punishing policies like the carbon tax, which are about to go up Response. by 23% on April 1st, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to fight for hardworking families in this province and put more money back into their pockets. Thank you. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. The <laughs> The carbon tax drives up the price of everything from filling up our cars and heating our homes in the winter. It hurts our economy and punishes the hard-working people and businesses of our province. That's true. Speaker, at a time of high interest rates and high cost of living, Ontarians need more financial relief, not another tax. While our government has been speaking up against this punitive tax since day one, the opposition NDP and independent Liberals continue to ignore its harmful impacts. Speaker, Ontarians deserve better from their elected officials. Here, here. Speaker, can Question. the minister tell this House what our government is doing to protect Ontario families and businesses from the high cost the Liberal carbon tax has on gas? And to reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Newmarket Aurora for that great question. You know, I would give her applause. You know, Mr. Speaker, the independent Liberals must think that money grows on trees because their continued support for a carbon tax on Ontarians makes no sense. And somehow, they continue to reject our great members' motions to eliminate the carbon tax and save businesses and consumers money when shopping for the goods they need to live in. Instead, our government is Order. standing up for the hard-working people of Ontario day in and day out by stepping in and cutting the gas tax and providing savings for people and businesses across this province. I look forward to that member and the independent Liberals and the Queen of the Carbon Tax Order. voting against a new carbon tax and for our new bill, the Get It Done Act 2024. Member for Orleans, come to order. 
Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. Speaker, we hear it from everyone. The carbon tax is simply not worth the cost. Across Ontario, households are struggling to make ends meet, and businesses continue to face economic uncertainty due to ongoing global supply chain challenges. They need support, not a tax that will cause unnecessary harm. We know that the independent Liberals refuse to stand up for their constituents and call on their federal counterparts to end the carbon tax. Speaker, our government will continue to lead by example and fight the carbon tax while keeping costs down for Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is supporting Ontario businesses and families? Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and to the great member for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, for too long, governments here and in Ottawa have left Ontarians behind. Workers, families, and businesses have had enough. And that's why they elected our government and our plan to get it done. That's why our government, it's our government who's building infrastructure, who's building more and more in Ontario and keeping costs down. Mr. Speaker, it's our government who is standing up to protect Ontarians from any party or government making life unaffordable. And it is this government who will continue to build Ontario into the best place to heat your home, fill up your tank, and buy your groceries. We're getting it done, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for London West. Thank you uh, very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, last week the Federal Immigration Minister said that comments about the international student cap made by the Minister of Colleges and Universities were, quote, complete garbage. Now, we may never know what really happened between those two ministers, but we do know that the cap was announced on January 22nd and it's now March 6th. Meanwhile, the application process for international students in this province is at a complete standstill until the government makes a decision on how the cap will be allocated and how attestation letters will be issued. Speaker, how much longer do Ontario colleges and universities have to wait? To reply, the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm surprised to hear the, the NDP uh, defending Justin Trudeau, yeah. frankly. And yes, I have expressed my dissatisfaction with the lack of consultation by the federal government. But don't just, just listen to me. In fact, the BC Premier, who is an NDP Premier, my message for Minister Miller would be to work with the province on this. A federal dictated cap could have profound and negative impacts. Mm. From the NDP BC Housing Minister, Minister Kalon, the concern I have is they need to talk to the provinces on how they are going to do this. Yeah. Saying they are going to put a cap on might sound good and get them through a media cycle, but these are people we are talking about. New Brunswick Post-Secondary Education Minister Holder, the cap is going to have a major challenge. It's going to throw a major wrench into the whole recruitment side of things this year. Penalized for their good work when it comes to recruiting Boss. international students, needs to help address the local labour market needs. In fact, the, minister, the federal minister did absolutely no consultation with any of the provinces. And yes, we are all dissatisfied with the result. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. The cap is now in place. This government should be trying to figure out how to move forward. Speaker, while Ontario drags its feet, international students who want to study here are applying elsewhere to BC, where they have figured out a process, or Quebec, or the UK, or Australia. Every day that goes by without an announcement just increases the financial uncertainty and chaos for Ontario colleges and universities. Can the minister at least tell this House how the cap will be allocated? Will the government take into account the track record of individual institutions in their approval rates for international study visas and in the supports they provide to international students. Members will please take their seats. 
Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, to the, the member for that question. And we have been working directly with uh, OUAC and OCAS, who are the, the systems that are in place for colleges and universities, for the attestation letter. So we will pr be providing our response shortly. But myself and many members of this House, and I've spoke with the Minister of Small Businesses, the impact that we're going to see on our local economies. And again, not just from me, but listen, the, I have a quote from the CFIB President Dan Kelly. The recent changes will have impact many small businesses who are grappling with labour shortages, particularly those in small and rural communities. Right. While it's understandable why government wants to put some limits in place, it needs to be to move more carefully and consider implications for the whole economy. The Niagara Chamber of Commerce, uh, Hugo Cheshire, if there is a sudden drop in the number of graduating students in these professions, in these Response. trades, and then years down the line, as that gap works down into the labour market, there will be another labour shortage to come. There just won't be enough students. Mr. Speaker, we will be looking forward to our response uh, coming shortly. Thank you. The next question. The member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the great Minister of Energy. The federal carbon tax is raising prices on everything from energy bills, groceries, and to everyday essentials. And that's why this Premier and our government fought this punitive tax all the way to the Supreme Court. Our government will always fight for the taxpayer in Ontario, Speaker. Last fall, the federal government chose to merely suspend the carbon tax on home heating oil, a source of higher emissions utilized only by 2.5 per cent of Ontarians. But the speaker, the tax on natural gas, which I use and 70 per cent of Ontarians Order. use, is going to go up, speaker. It's unfair that the federal Liberals and provincial Liberals, don't call their colleagues in Ottawa, are ignoring the burden Question. being placed on most Ontarians. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House why the federal government's selective exemption on the carbon tax is unfair. Great the parliamentary assistant and member for Kitchener South Hustle. And I, I thank the member for his, uh, his very passionate question. I know that he is a dedicated representative of uh, his constituents, many of which include rural communities and farmers who are particularly impacted by this devastating tax. We have heard time and time again in this House just how damaging this is for greenhouse growers, for small businesses, for farmers, for families, and for the federal government to continue ignoring our pleas for a break to ax this tax. Speaker, there really is no answer for it. This is the most damaging thing that Ontarians are currently facing, and the fact that it's going up even higher is unconscionable. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to our great parliamentary assistant for their response. Speaker, home heating is not a luxury. It is a necessity in Ontario. However, many Ontarians cannot afford to pick and choose what heating fuel they can use whether it's home heating oil or natural gas or other forms of gas like propane, and they were here last week, great propane members and businesses in my riding, Speaker, Ontarians should not be unfairly forced to pay additional costs to stay warm during the winter months. Yes, and it's unfortunate that the only party in this legislature that is focused on providing real relief to Ontarians is this party on this side in the missing middle over there, Speaker. While the Liberals and NDP are content with the carbon tax going up on April 1st, as you can hear, Speaker, in this place, our government continues to Question. keep costs down for the people of Ontario. Can the parliamentary assistant please share the steps our government is taking to provide more affordability for home heating as the federal carbon tax skyrockets? Speaker. Parliamentary assistant. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I guess it takes two parliamentary assistants to be just as great as the minister. <laughs> so, but I'd like to uh, thank the member for the, that additional question. Our government continues to make investments aimed at keeping energy costs affordable for families. In the past year alone, we announced the enhancement of the Ontario electricity rebate, ensuring stability and predictability in electricity bills. 
That's going to save an average household more than $300 this year alone, Mr. Speaker. But that's not going to help if the opposition and the federal government keep pushing a painful carbon tax. That's right. We urge the federal government to join efforts in terminating the carbon tax on home eating for Ontarians, just like they have done for a majority of people in Atlantic Canada. It is imperative for the federal government to act promptly. Winter isn't over yet, sir, and uh, folks are still paying for the electricity bill. The next question, member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. Question for the Premier, Speaker. Paying for blood and plasma donations is banned in Ontario, but incredibly, this government is allowing a Spanish company to open a centre in Hamilton that will pay for plasma. Ontario's Voluntary Blood Donations Act prohibits payment for blood. This is a law which the Minister of, herself, or of Health herself voted in favour of. So my question to the Premier, will you stand by and allow a for-profit plasma industry, or will you enforce the law? To respond, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Um, I think it's important to remind the member opposite and everyone in Ontario continues to monitor Health Canada's regulatory approach to drugs for rare diseases and how it can impact our communities. Some of the changes outlined mean that we have seen Health Canada and the Canadian Blood Services make some partnerships with others to ensure that we have critical plasma supply in the province of Ontario. There is no doubt that plasma supply need increases. It is a critical part of what we need to do every time there are operations in the province of Ontario. Uh, Canada Blood Services has made some partnerships, and we will watch to ensure that they follow all Ontario regulatory pieces. Supplementary question, member for Hamilton Mountain. That sounds like a no to enforcing the law. Exactly. Speaker, back to the Premier. Almost 10 years ago to the day, the headline of Pay for Plasma Centres is back in the news. Greifold, this private for-profit company from Spain, has pinpointed it down to postal codes, with the highest unemployment rates and the lowest income in the province. They plan to set up a shop and prey on our most vulnerable by use of way of an exemption loophole. In a community where many are unhoused, waiting in long food bank lines, and struggling day to day to make ends meet. Speaker, does the Premier think it's appropriate that people will be selling their blood to survive? Mr. Health. Finder Canada Blood Services is a national not-for-profit charitable organization and is the only national manufacturer of biological products. In Canada, we know that blood donations have unfortunately decreased in the last decade. And Canada Blood Services has worked with a partnership uh, with another supplier, and all medical operators in Ontario, as always, are required to comply with those Ontario laws. Look, we will monitor what Canada Blood Services is doing, but I do not want to lose fact and lose sight of the fact that donations of blood, donations of plasma, donations of organs are a critical Order. part of our health care system. And that voluntary piece is some of the work that Canada Blood Services does. Thank you, Speaker. The Hamilton members will come to order. I was the next question, the member for Orleans. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My, uh, my question is for the Premier. The Premier says he wants judges who will be tougher uh, during bail hearings. And on this, we can agree. And that's why we worked with the government last year on bail reform. But the Premier also says he wants to abolish the independent judicial system in exchange for a politicized one with like-minded judges, one that's used and abused south of the border. So he's appointed biased, unqualified political insiders notably his former Deputy Chief of Staff, to lead the panel that makes judicial recommendations. But the problem with politicizing the judicial system, Mr. Speaker, is that the Premier's former Deputy Chief of Staff is also a paid gun lobbyist for Colts. So, Mr. Speaker, how can we expect judges to get tougher on gun crime when the guy recommending them for the job is the guy who sells the guns? And to reply, the Attorney General. 
Mr. Speaker, I, I think the member opposite has a reading comprehension uh, issue, Mr. Speaker, because that is not what we have been saying, Mr. Speaker, at all, at all. Now, here's the thing, Mr. Speaker. They, they continue to raise the same issue over and over because they don't want to talk about things like the fact that the carbon tax is going up, Mr. Speaker. The only stated position oh, of the Liberal right. Party on the carbon tax is that it's good for people. The member in the back's laughing, but she said it's good for people. That was that was doubled down, Mr. Speaker, by the NDP, Order. who said get over it, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'll tell you something, Mr. Speaker. There is some hope. There is some hope. They Order. have a new leader, and the new leader has never heard of the issue Order. before. So here's what she needs to know: the Opposition carbon tax will have 23 percent on April the first, and doing? that should be job one, Mr. Shame Speaker. Order. The supplementary question. I'd like to thank the Premier for that answer. Next thing you know, Mr. Speaker, they're going to appoint a tobacco lobbyist to lead smoke-free Ontario. <laughs> look, look, gun crime, is no, gun crime is no laughing matter. Police in Ontario reported 4,791 violent gun crimes in 2022. Order. That's 1,000 more. That's 1,000 more than the previous year, Mr. Speaker. Homicide by gun crime is at an all-time high. The Premier has nice catchphrases. The Premier has nice catchphrases like stop the crime and get tough on bail reform, but he's asked the guy who sells the guns for advice. Mr. Speaker, there is a violent gun crime in Ontario every two hours. How can we believe the Premier's tough on crime stance when he's asked the guy who sells the guns to appoint the judges? To reply, the Premier. Here we go again, Mr. Speaker. Not doubling down, tripling down, quadrupling down, quintupling down. And I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm proud to go out there and tell the people that have seen violence in their homes, violence on the streets, violence in our subways, that we're going to get judges that are actually going to keep these criminals in jail. There isn't a person around the Toronto GTA hasn't faced some sort of crime, a gun to their heads in their homes, hand over the keys, kicking the doors, order. only to see, Mr. Speaker, these clock. Clock, clock. Okay, I, I, I must be able to hear the member who has the floor. In this case, it's the Premier. I'm going to ask the member for Ottawa South, the member for Orleans, to come to order. I'm going to ask the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to come to order. If, if this persists, I will start warning members. Do you hear me? <laughs> start the clock. The Premier has the floor. Only to see these violent criminals, Mr. Speaker, get out on bail. And guess what they do? The next day they're out on bail after our police officers put their lives on the line to arrest them. They're back kicking in the doors again, putting guns to people's heads, Response. stealing the cars, running, trying to run over our police officers. But the Liberals and NDP, they think that's fine. Let's stay the status quo. I'll tell you one thing. We aren't staying the status quo. We're going to get judges that are tough on crime. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Order. The Premier will come to order. Member for Ottawa South will come to order. Start the clock. The next question. The Member for Ajax. Thank you, Speaker. I was waiting to exhale. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. The rising cost of fuel has greatly impacted individuals and families in every corner of the province, including mine. Unfortunately, at a time when Ontarians are already struggling with rising inflation costs, the federal Liberals continue to, rise to raise the carbon tax. Speaker, I've heard from logistics and distribution companies in my riding who have been very vocal about the impact of the carbon tax on their bottom line and the truckers in their industry. It is unacceptable that the federal government continues to punish truckers that drive Ontario's economy forward with this regressive tax. Speaker, 
Can the minister please tell the House how the carbon tax is hard on Ontario's trucking industry? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member for Ajax for that question. We know that the federal environment minister is completely out of touch with the realities of Canadians and especially Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. We have called on him. I have personally called on him to come drive on the 427, the 401, the 410 to see for himself the challenges our truckers and drivers are having across this province. But Minister, Mr. Speaker, Minister Guibault spends more time flying around the world and, uh, and airplanes trying to meet with uh, elites across the world rather than actually meeting with truckers that are driving every single day on our roads across this province to put food on the shelves, to put uh, uh, groceries on, on shelves of, across this province. They shouldn't have to worry about the rise of the cost of gas, Mr. Speaker, as they do their job. I've stated in the House before, fifteen dollars to $20,000 a current cost on a trucker, a long-haul trucker uh, in this province on the current uh, carbon tax today. That's about to go up by 23 per cent on April 1st, and I hope the members opposite join us in calling on the federal government to stop the carbon tax. The supplementary question. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. We are all indebted to the dedicated workers in the trucking industry who deliver essential goods that Ontario's families and businesses rely on. But, Speaker, it is unfortunate that the impact of the carbon tax on the trucking industry ultimately affects the consumers and the drivers. We are all forced to pay for the additional cost to fuel that attracts transport the essential items for our everyday living. That's not fair, Speaker. Our government hears these concerns day after day, and that is why we will not stop until this tax is scrapped. Speaker, can the minister please explain further why the carbon tax must be eliminated to protect Ontario's trucking industry? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That member is absolutely right. That tax is not fair. It punishes families. It punishes truckers, Mr. Speaker. As I said, ten to fifteen to twenty thousand dollars a year for long haul uh, truckers on the cost of the carbon tax. We know that it's going up 23 percent on April 1st, and that's going to impact truckers, but it's also going to impact drivers and families all across Ontario, Mr. Speaker. As this government is committed to putting more money back into the pockets of families across this province, the federal carbon tax will increase by 23 percent, Mr. Speaker. That is unacceptable. We're always looking at ways to make sure we put more money back into your pockets, whether it's reducing the gas tax by 10 cents, whether it's making sure we reduce uh, or get eliminate the, the valve tag, you know, $120 saving per car or truck for families uh, across this province. We're going to continue Fonts. to urge both the Liberals and NDP to call on their federal car counterparts and stop the carbon tax on April 1st. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Roseton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario can now find landlords that illegally evict up to $250,000, but it never does. A Toronto Star analysis found that the Rental Housing Enforcement Unit and the Landlord Tenant Board issues very small fines to guilty landlords, fines the landlord can quickly recoup by hiking the rent on the next tenant. My question is to the Premier. Will this government start enforcing its own illegal eviction laws? To reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm wondering if the member is asking if we will pierce the independence of the Landlord Tenant Board adjudicators, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure. I'm hearing an inconsistency. I'm not quite sure what direction they want us to take in terms of independence of, of adjudicators and the enforcement of orders, Mr. Speaker. Uh, for us to reach in and make the adjudicators do something, now that would be a question, Mr. Speaker, and that would be something that we would have to discuss. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I'd like a clarification, if I could, in the second question. <laughs> Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. It is the government's job to enforce its own laws. Stop trying to pass the buck. <laughs> Rental protection laws are useless if they're not enforced. We have presented practical solutions to this government to help renters stay housed. We have introduced amendments in committee. We have introduced bills in this legislature. When will this government start taking effective action and do its job and start enforcing its illegal eviction laws? The Attorney General. 
and a lot of those laws go to court, Mr. Speaker, and the judges make decisions about the laws. Are they asking us to make adjudicators do things because just because we passed a law that we have the right to reach across that line and make adjudicators do things, Mr. Speaker? Entirely inconsistent with the previous questions, Mr. Speaker. Now, we are investing in the Landlord Tenant Board. We have doubled the number of adjudicators. We've added more staff. We've had more hearings than we've had intake, Mr. Speaker. We are making sure that they're properly resourced and people are, are having a place to, to have their hearings. Now, Mr. Speaker, but tenants also need a place to live. And if you take Mississauga as an example, where they only built 12 housing starts uh, last in the last term, and the development charges are up 27 percent, Mr. Speaker. Oh now, God. that's a problem because Order. no matter whether you have a hearing, Aunt. you wouldn't have a place to live, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Once again this morning, there's been a lot of talk about like-minded appointments. But while this House has had their eyes set on judicial appointments, I've had mine set on the Ontario Land Tribunal. Just before Christmas, I hit refresh on the Public Appointments Secretariat page, and exactly as I had suspected, the appointment of the former mayor of Haldeman County, Ken Hewitt, to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Keep in mind, this is a tribunal meant to protect public good. Speaker, I respectfully ask if the Premier can articulate what skills and qualifications one must possess to be considered an appointee to the OLT. To reply, the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm proud of the members that have been appointed to the, to the Ontario Land Tribunal. It's a very important tribunal, Mr. Speaker, and you'll recall that we, we combined five other tribunals to make the system more streamlined, Mr. Speaker. The, the individuals who apply through an open process, they are evaluated by the chair of the tribunal, Mr. Speaker, and recommendations come forward for appointment. And I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the chair who does the, the interviews and does the recruitment because that's a hands-off process, as you would expect it to be, Mr. Speaker. Order. But I can tell you, any mayor of any municipality in this province likely has some exposure to how Opposition things work in terms of committee order. adjustments and otherwise. So through you, Mr. Speaker, back to the member, uh, what disqualifies that member, Mr. Speaker? Order. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And I'll answer that question because the member opposite said it's a very important tribunal, so I'd expect the prime qualification would be to uphold the mandate of the OLT. But interestingly enough, in February 2022, Mr. Hewitt called on this government to dissolve the Ontario Land Tribunal because it was slowing development. He then proposed a city of 40,000 at the Nanny Coke Industrial Park, and then the Premier appointed him the PC candidate in Haldeman, Norfolk. But it gets worse. A developer friend of the Premier's plans to build a seasonal cottage development on agricultural land at Lowbanks in Haldeman County. And just days before that developer is to appear before Council, he coincidentally cancels and says he'll take his chances at the OLT. It's difficult not to conclude that the tribunal Question. has been hijacked. The Hamilton Spectator reported in 2022 that the OLT rules in favour of developers 97 per cent of the time. Speaker, through you to the Premier, is the OLT in place to protect the public good, or is it in place to accelerate development and feather the nest of developers and friends of this government? Order. 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 The Attorney General can reply. Mr. Speaker, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I do appreciate the question. You know, the excellent adjudicators that we have at the OLT and our other tribunals, Mr. Speaker. You know, we're talking about somebody with an accomplished public career, Mr. Speaker, and and you know, we can go down the rabbit hole on any given on any given uh, scenario. But the important thing is this, Mr. Speaker. It, we're getting the job done by having hearings that are fair, equitable, and timely, Mr. Speaker. We have 1.5 million homes to build, Mr. Speaker, yeah, yeah. and we want to make sure that matters are moving through that tribunal. And if you want to accuse us of meddling because we're getting homes built, Mr. Speaker, Order. I will tell you there are rules and professionals in place to help get the job done, and we will get those homes built, Mr. Speaker. The opposition come to order. Order. 
The next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. Great. The carbon tax is essentially a tax on everything, Speaker. It's on your groceries, your gasoline, your home heating, and every other day-to-day -day essential. For over a year now, Speaker, the Chiefs of Ontario have been calling on the federal government to consult with them on the impact that this harmful tax is having on all of their communities. Due to the federal government's failure to address the First Nations concerns, the Chiefs of Ontario filed for judicial review into the application of the carbon tax in Indigenous communities. They have called this tax anti-reconciliatory and anti-reconciliatory and discriminatory. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how this carbon tax is disproportionately impacting Question. Northern Ontario communities? Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. He did so with good reason, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the honourable member for his question. We heard earlier this morning about a prime minister who backed up his words with policies, commitment and change. So I got to take a prime minister at his word when he says we're walking the road of reconciliation in quotes and then says with respect to costs, indigenous communities on affordability and supports, you think he would do something. Silence, Mr. Speaker. The calls from First Nations communities across the province, but particularly from communities in the isolated parts of Northern Ontario who look at $7 loaves of Wonder Bread, Mr. Speaker, with a built-in cost for transportation of those goods, has put the carbon tax front row uh, centre, Mr. Speaker. And what did the federal government do? Well, they have pledged 0.7 per cent of total charge proceeds. Response? to First Nations Communities Ontario. We don't know where this is and how it will materialize, Mr. Speaker, but it's a small sliver, a fraction of the costs that First Nations communities are paying as a result of the carbon tax. The supplementary question. Thank you again, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. The carbon tax is making everything more expensive for Ontarians, especially those of us in Northern Ontario. And in unlike other parts of the province, the North has very unique barriers when it comes to fuel costs, Speaker. Instead of helping Northern Ontario foster economic growth and to reach our full potential, the federal government is bringing one tax hike after another, after another, after another. It is clear that neither the Liberals nor the NDP understand, respect or care about the financial hardship that many individuals and families are going through. Northern and Indigenous communities should not be paying the price of this harmful and regressive tax. Speaker, can the minister please explain further why the carbon Question. tax has such detrimental effects on Northern Ontario and especially First Nation communities? Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, for anybody who's visited or spent time in the isolated communities, you gain a deep appreciation for the costs that are associated with shipping goods into those communities. It's why our government took the extraordinary step to reduce the taxes off of uh, um, airline services that were offering uh, shipping of goods and services to those communities, Mr. Speaker. And in light of a difficult uh, winter road season, Mr. Speaker. All season roads have become the topic, Mr. Speaker. And since it'll be a little while before electric vehicles provide part of that transportation solution, not only communities on diesel, but communities who need transport this winter and winters moving forward, do you think the federal government would remove the, tar the carbon tax as a starting point and join the federal government in our discussions around all seasons roads? Response. Mr. Speaker, again, radio silence. This government is laser-focused on challenging the federal government to reduce costs for our northern communities, and it starts with scrapping the tax. Mr. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Small businesses have not fully recovered from the pandemic. They are still struggling with inflation and economic uncertainty. The government's website encourages small businesses to sign up for the digital Main Street 
grant program. But this Conservative government told the Toronto Association of Business Improvement Area members that the funding for the program will be cancelled in three weeks. Why is the government abandoning small businesses yet again? The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. The Digital Main Street program was a phenomenal program, although brought in prior to the pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, was key to helping many of our businesses. Actually, over 82,000 businesses get an online presence, and about 24,000 businesses start or expand their e-commerce journey over two years. But you know what's really exciting, Premier? Uh, sorry, Speaker is the sudden concern for our small businesses by the members opposite. So, Speaker, we are talking to our stakeholders, we're engaging with them constantly, but let me talk about some of the other wonderful supports Response? available to our businesses. The um, Digital Competence Centre. It connects companies with innovative digital solutions and helps SMEs across all sectors implement new digital technologies. The Canada Digital Adoption Programme, very Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And back to the Premier. As someone who's owned several small businesses, I know firsthand how hard it is to get a small business off the ground. I launched my businesses before today's challenges of every fast technology change and costly inflation hikes. Sonia Scarf, a small business owner in my riding, told me the Digital Main Street program helps small businesses like ours offset costs and build an online presence. This program is an extremely valuable asset to small businesses. I can only praise their work. Now is not the time for the Premier to pull the plug on Digital Main Street funding, and it is never time to abandon small businesses in Ontario. Yes or no, will the Premier reverse course, listen to small business owners, and maintain funding to keep the lights on for the Digital Main Street program? And the Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member opposite for the question. Uh, first, I'd like to remind all members in this House that it was the opposition members that voted against the funding for the Digital Main Street program. But no surprise, because they really, really do not understand their small businesses. But you know what? What would have helped small businesses recently was where the federal government provided absolutely no reprieve for the CBA loan repayments. When I asked them to, I asked everyone in this House to contact their federal members. Nothing. They did nothing. nothing. Stayed silent. Another area that could really help our small businesses was if they pick up the phone, talk to their federal co cousins, and ask them to scrap the carbon tax because it hurts every single business and individual in this province. But they won't do that. They will not call their federal cousins and carbon crumbies. It's liberals over there, silent. They will do nothing. Pick up the phone, scrap the carbon tax right now. You Once. can do that for your small businesses yeah, yeah, yeah. today. I remind the members to make their comments to the chair. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. We all know that carbon tax is making more expensive for Ontario families and businesses. Not only is it increasing the cost of goods, but it's also driving up costs of fuel and gasoline for everyone in our province. What's more, public safety services across the province are being impacted by the carbon tax as well. Speaker, our police services need more support and resources to protect our communities, not additional fuel costs because of the carbon tax. Speaker, can the Solicitor General please explain the negative effects of carbon tax on tax and on law enforcement and public safety agencies across Ontario? And to respond, the Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for the question. Ontarians have told us very clearly, public safety means everything to them. And you know what, Mr. Speaker? It's a top priority for our government, led by Premier Ford. Uh -huh. The carbon tax has significantly increased the cost of public safety. 
And in a few weeks, as we know, the federal government will do it again and no. raise the carbon tax by 23 per cent. And it's affecting our firefighters and our police officers, our special constables and our first responders, people that are there to fight crime. Every day, thousands of vehicles are on the road that help keep our province safe. And the police budgets have to cover the carbon tax on these cars that get fueled up. My message is simple. The Liberals across the way can call their friends in Ottawa and say, this is not fair, scrap the tax. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Solicitor General for the response. It is concerning to hear that the carbon tax is affecting public safety efforts in Ontario. We, with the media reports about the crime and legal, illegal activities in many areas of our province, residents in my community of Richmond Hill are concerned about the financial impact of the carbon tax on the day-to-day -day work of our frontline police workers. They are worried about how the carbon tax is placing on the strain of policing services, as well as on the budget. Speaker, our government must ensure police officers receive support as they carry out their duties. Could the so Solicitor General provide Question. further details about the government's initiatives to strengthen Ontario's public safety in light of the carbon tax? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we'll, when people are being confronted by having their doors kicked in and their cars stolen, when people are being confronted by violent and repeat offenders on our streets, we need more boots on the ground as soon as possible. And when we look at what the carbon tax is doing for police service budgets, the OPP alone has spent almost $4 million what? on carbon tax. $4 million could have put 40 new boots on the ground, and that's just the OPP. And when I look around this chamber and I think of the First Nations police services and the other municipal police services across the province, Bastards. how many more boots on the ground could we have? The carbon tax is regressive. It hits us everywhere. It's hitting us on public safety. The Liberals across the way can do the right thing. Pick up the phone, Respond. tell them, pause the tax. It is affecting our public safety. The next question, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Last year, the Ministry of Natural Resources started the spring with a shortage of 50 crews to tackle forest fires lacking pre preparedness and seeking help from across Canada and Mexico. My question is simple. Given the extreme lack of snow condition this year, how many wildfire ranger crews do we need to be prepared for wildfires this season, and how many do we have as of right now? The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm, I'm glad the member opposite asked the question because recruitment is open right now for more fire rangers in Ontario. We've got many, many great returning crews from last year. We know that we'll have new recruits this year to supplement a, a, a crew of those in the air, those on the ground fighting fires, keeping communities safe, keeping infrastructure safe. Uh, small communities all throughout the North, Indigenous communities, incredibly important, and I'm very, very glad that the member is supporting recruitment and retention of our firefighters. We want more to come into the fold, so I'd encourage everybody to make sure that you're letting people know that recruitment is open right now and everyone is welcome to apply. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning.